Thank you very much, Lou. This is a, a real, a real pleasure. Uh, <clears throat> this is uh, it's going to be difficult to uh, explain all of Austrian economics and Mises' role in, uh, in a short period of time. I will try to my best. <clears throat> uh, first place about Austrian economics. Uh, contrary to many impressions, that has nothing to do with Austria. The, uh, I know nothing about the economics of Austria. It doesn't mean it's not it doesn't mean it's not a viable subject, but it's just that uh, I don't know much about it. Also, there are very few Austrians left in Austria. <laughs> yeah, they're all here. <laughs> so that's uh, <laughs> uh, it. Um, Austrian e economics began as a um, in the University of Vienna with Karl Menger. And uh, the early Austrians were indeed located in Austria, and then, it, then the, uh, the doctrine permeated outward. Uh, the, um, the, the essence of, of Austrian economics is that it was, it's, it's based on, in contrast to all other schools, including uh, alleged free market schools of, of economics, uh, the Austrian economics is, is based on an, an, an analysis of individual action, in other words, individuals doing things, having purposes and goals, and pursuing them. Uh, <clears throat> this immediately sets us apart, because all the other schools of e economics deal with aggregates, groups, classes, uh, holes, and one sort or another, without, without focusing on the in individual first and building up from there. Uh, <clears throat> the, um, I'd have to start with, uh, I could easily make this about five hours instead of 45 minutes, so I'm going to try to uh, truncate this. Um, Austrian economics basically <coughs> builds on an earlier tradition of French, French and Italian, especially French continental tradition, uh, really beginning with the Spanish scholastics in the, middle, in the 16th century and then uh, proceeding on to in France with Cantillon and Turgot in the 18th century. Uh, this was buried for, one, for various reasons. This, this, this knowledge was lost to economic thought and superseded by the British classical school, by Smith and Ricardo and their, their followers. <clears throat> so this uh, immediately starts a new, now a new history of thought because most, e most economists, I think, still think that economics began sort of out, of out of the forehead of Adam Smith. You know, in 1776, he sort of created it like Athena springing from the brow of Zeus. Actually, economics not only predated Smith by several centuries, but also was much better and Smith. In other words, Smith represents the decline. At any rate, the, uh, the British classical school, Smith, Ricardo, etc., John Stuart Mill, um, focused on aggregates and groups and classes rather than the individual, number one. <clears throat> uh, basically, the, uh, you could sum up the classical school as several key fallacies, or, and these, this was dominant until Menger came around in 1871. <clears throat> um, one, the value, economic value, price, is determined by the cost of production, the cost of production embodied in some fashion in the product, uh, and specifically by the quantity of labor hours embodied in it. <clears throat> uh, and we can pretty well see, almost automatically, if we, if we look at this thing in a clear-eyed fashion, there's something wrong with it, because I could work... I remember there was a movie, it was kind of a charming movie, a great Z movie that came out about 20 years ago, <clears throat> I forget the title, but the essence of it was some great inventor in somewhere in the west of England, living there, totally isolated, and he kept inventing great things like the radio and, and television and all that, except it had already been invented 20 years before, so he, he didn't know about it. So uh, he was a great inventor, he just he was he invented the wheel or whatever, too late. <laughs> but he was working, he you know, put, must have put in 100,000 labor hours in these inventions. How many of these sell? Obviously zero. So the economic value would not obviously depend on his quantity of labor hours. Uh, at any rate, <clears throat> the, um, the class, what the classical school had to do was dismiss as unimportant a whole group of economic goods and not able to explain their value, namely reproduce, non-reproducible objects, goods that are not being produced uh, anymore, like Rembrandt's. I mean, Rembrandt put in a certain number of labor hours, I suppose, but the price of Rembrandt keeps fluctuating since then, not in accordance with somebody's input on hopes. <laughs> Otherwise, it would be forgery. <laughs> so, so what determines the, the value of Rembrandt? Well, they couldn't figure it out. They just had to leave it aside as, un, as, as unimportant. 
And uh, they couldn't deal about, with consumers either, because with consumers they came up against the famous value paradox, which he, he, history of economics always, always tells about. That Smith was buffalo by the value paradox. The peculiar thing was he solved it himself about 20 years before. So it's a very odd kind of situation. At any rate, in the Wealth of Nations, <coughs> he sets forth the value paradox. It's a terrible thing, you can't understand it. On one hand, there's diamonds, let's say. On the other hand, there's bread or water. You can use either one of the two. And bread is a staff of life that's philosophically extremely important and uh, very necessary, and yet it's very cheap on the market. In other words, the economic value is zilch. It's very, it's very cheap, not, not zero. Water, is the economic value used to be zero. <coughs> and on the other hand, we have diamonds, which are mere frippery, uh, a luxury item, and so forth and so on. And Adam Smith, being a good Calvinist, uh, said they have zero value, <laughs> diamonds, and yet they're very expensive. They have very high economic value. So he couldn't figure that out, the value of paradox. Some, here's bread, which was extremely useful, yet has very low economic value, and diamonds, which are useless or almost useless and have very high economic value. And he concluded e economics can't solve this. There's two, just a split between value and use and value... Uh, and exchange. There's no way to solve it. We have to deal with exchange value and forget about use value. Now you see right away this sets up the conditions for the for a whole bunch of left-wing thought in the late 19th, early 20th century. I think it's still going on, I suppose. The separation between value for use and value for, I mean, production for use and production for profit. That's what immediately sets that up. But somehow it's a big distinction. <coughs> um, so uh, he said, therefore, we, have to, we can't deal with consumers, we can't deal with non-reproducible goods, we have to deal with producible, reproducible goods, and we can only talk about, since we can't talk about consumers, value must come from something inherent in the, in the object, namely labor hours. <coughs> Another use, reason he used labor hours is that he, was trying to, he and Ricardo were trying to measure value all the time, because science meant measurement, even in those days, for, for these people. And so therefore, how do you measure value, how do you measure changes? They were looking for some hard quantity, and they concluded the labor hours was about the best thing they could get to. So that was one big fallacy, one big dominant fallacy in economic thought when Menger was started to write. <clears throat> the other big, another big fallacy is that they, since they couldn't deal with individuals at all, they were dealing with classes, uh, they had a separate thing called distribution, theory of distribution, trying to figure out, this is Ricardo in particular, uh, who, does, who decides how much, how much of the national output goes to wages, how much goes to profits, how much goes, goes to landlords. And so what you, when he, the way he set it up was is there's a class struggle between three, these two, three mighty groups. In other words, the good is produced somewhere, something, they produce it, then they fight for who gets the, the different shares of income. The laborers, laborers get, it's, get messed up here. Laborers are the dirty end of the stick. Because wages are determined by the iron law of wages, the Malthusian iron law. It's down at subsistence level, as we all know. We're sitting here living at subsistence level <laughs> at the Anaheim Hilton. <laughs> uh, everybody gets the lowest possible wages. That so takes care of the workers. <clears throat> and capital, capitalists and landlords fight it out for the rest of it. <clears throat> With usually landlords winning out because they get an increasing share of un these unproductive group of people uh, get an increasing share of, of income. Well, this obviously led, this, this analysis seems to me led logically straight away to Marx and Henry George, two different sets of thinkers, but one, each focusing on different aspects of it. Marx focusing on the alleged surplus value going to the, to the capitalists against the workers, and somehow capitalism conspiring to, to keep the wages of people down to the, uh, keep them down to the subsistence level. On the other hand, Henry George focusing on evil, un evil unproductive landlords getting an increasing share of the natural product. They should be expropriated. Now, of course, Smith and Ricardo did not believe they should be expropriated. They didn't think in those terms. But it seems to me it's pretty logical that if you're looking, if you're interested in justice rather than only economic analysis, you will wind up as either, if you're a Ricardian, you wind up as either a Marxist or a Georgist. <coughs> Some people, of course, take both paths, sort of Marxo-Georgists. Okay, so this the second big <coughs> dominant <coughs> force in classical, British classical economics. The third one, uh, well, the third thing is asking, how could they be so wrong? How could they focus on this unreal situation? <coughs> uh, labor hours. And by the way, the labor theory of value, I think I should backtrack slightly on that. The, this is pure speculation, but I think it's probably true but it's, it's no accident that only in Scotland did the labor theory of value originate. I mean, nobody in the continent, nobody in France, Italy, none of the Spanish scholastics ever thought in terms of, they said labor comes from consumers, consumer demand. They didn't, they didn't 
isn't told in terms of labor value. Uh, <clears throat> it seems to be not an accident because uh, Scotland, of course, is the classical home of Calvinism, and Calvinist doctrine is that uh, people are, labor is a key thing. So it's it's everybody is doomed to work. And consumer enjoyment, by the way, is evil. And as Adam Smith said, it's use diamonds are useless. And so uh, you, you, uh, you, 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 the only reason you consume anything is to allow you to keep working because of God's commandment to suffer, or keep suffering. So <clears throat> this sort of Calvinist attitude leads pretty quickly, I think, to a, a labor theory of value. At any rate, the third, so that's one, two, two big fallacious aspects of British classical school. Uh, labor theory of value or cost theory of value. One, two classes or aggregate class struggle over shares of income. And the third thing is to focus totally on a non-existent, unreal, long-run equilibrium. Now this is done right now by modern microeconomics and macroeconomics for that matter. Uh, current neoclassical neoclassical economics focuses solely on reason that Lou mentioned before, they don't talk about entrepreneurs. They don't, it's very simple why they don't talk about entrepreneurs. They don't talk about entrepreneurs because entrepreneurs deal with change and uncertainty. You make a profit if you can forecast better than the next guy. Uh, you make a losses if you can't forecast. But in perfect and long-run equilibrium, you don't have to forecast anything. Nothing ever changes. Since nothing ever changes, everybody has perfect knowledge, as they call it, perfect knowledge, perfect, everybody's in perfect c competition. There's no uncertainty, there's no risk, there's no profits and no losses. And so the entrepreneur then becomes a pain in the neck. It becomes a, a messing up your neat mathematical system. And this again stems from British, British classical school. They didn't, they didn't have the mathematical diagrams or anything, but they had the, the essence of Ricardo in particular, uh, focusing only on long-run equilibrium. <coughs> uh, as a result of and fourth of three, the fourth thing, which goes along with this, is again Ricardo's contribution of economic thought, quote, contribution, unquote, is to separate divide totally the macro from the micro sphere. Of course, we're all, we're all familiar with that, those of us who take current economics. There's micro, the first term or the second whatever, second term. Micro, you learn about supply and demand or whatever, and then suddenly you leap into macro, and nobody talks about supply and demand. They all talk about growth curves and, and velocity and all that. Totally different. And this whole split starts with Ricardo also. <laughs> um, okay, and so the, with Ricardo, the quantity of money only determines the general price level. If you increase the money supply, prices go up. It has no impact on production, on, on profits, on interest, on uh, relative, relative prices or anything else. It's just sort of it's like two hermetically spe sealed spheres. There's the microsphere where things are going on, so it's fairly understandable, supply and demand, prices and all that. Then there's the macrosphere, totally cut off from the micro, where you have money and prices bouncing up and down with no relationship between the two. <clears throat> Okay, it was in that kind of atmosphere, and it, uh, set up, dominant, British classical school dominance. By the way, it now turns out, uh, not everybody was a Ricardian from 1819 until 1871. The British themselves began to peck away at Ricardianism shortly after he died. By 1830, there were, there were no Ricardians left. But what happened was that John Stuart Mill um, re resurrected Ricardianism his famous principles in 1848. And he had such tremendous moral authority by the, on the public. They were so revered. Almost anything he said was accepted as uh, gospel truth. And so he restored Ricardianism to, its, to, to, to a dominant, politically placed it as a, a dominant pedestal. <clears throat> and he did it because he was brainwashed by his father, who was a top Ricardian, and so forth and so on. So I'm not going to get into that can of worms at this point. <laughs> at any rate, it's in that atmosphere that, that Karl Menger, the founder of Western Economics, writes his great, path-breaking, magnificent book, Principles of Economics, in 1871. <clears throat> uh, what he does, he builds on the earlier continental tradition, but essentially he develops this whole uh, path-breaking system. Okay, well, what is it? What, to sum it up, the Austrian system is created by Menger and a student, von Bawerk, at the University of Vienna. Um, Essentially, it's based on methodological individualism. In other words, focusing on the indiv individual first, the individual's actions. In other words, the individual, the idea is the individual has a purpose, has goals that he, wants to, he or she wants to pursue. Uh, in order to pursue these goals, you have to use resources or means to pursue them. And it takes time to do all this, etc., etc. You start with Crusoe and you work on up to uh, different in individuals and exchanges, and building up the whole economic analysis from the individual. <coughs> 
and it hadn't really been done before. It had been done partially, but it had never been done systematically as, as Menger did it. And as Bombardier did, uh, developing it even further, especially in capital theory and entrepreneurial theory. <clears throat> so looking at it that way, you realize that the purpose of production is consumption. The idea, of, the reason why the inventor worked the 200,000 labor hours is that he hopes that somebody will buy it. And so value is conferred by the consumers, by the demand of consumers, and goes backward from the subjective valuations of consumers down through to the factors of production that the people receive income. So you have, in other words, the demand theory or the consumer demand theory of value, the subjective value theory, instead of the cost of production doctrine. And now, of course, we immediately explain why Rembrandts are now, you know, might be $2 million now, $1 million 10 years ago, because consumers are paying more for it. They're willing to pay more for it now than they were before. Their valuations are higher, <clears throat> either because of general inflation, they have more money, or because Rembrandts are now preferred more to other art than they were you know, 10 years ago. So, uh, and secondly, we now looking and focusing on the individual action, we can see that individuals take, make their evaluations in marginal units. This is the so-called marginal revolution. In other words, they don't take the bread diamond paradox, which Menger and the other marginalists solved. Namely, um, you, nobody is confronted in real life. See, we're looking at real life action. Nobody is confronted with the choice of all the bread in the world versus all the diamonds in the world. In other words, if the angel Gabriel came down to us tonight and said, you know, captured nationwide tele and worldwide television, and said, people of Earth, listen, uh, you're not confronted with a choice between all the bread in the world from now on forever and all the diamonds in the world. You're going to lose one of them, one set. Probably most of us would vote for bread, but the point is we're not confronted with that kind of choice yet. <laughs> and uh, we're confronted with individual choice, like should we buy a loaf of bread or a five-carat diamond or something like that. And in these marginal units, then we realize that supply becomes the, the major f focus here. In other words, the more abundant, the, if bread is very abundant, the unit of bread is not going to be worth much because it's super abundant. The other half is if diamonds are very rare, each individual diamond is going to be worth a lot. And so in other words, these valuations take place in units, in marginal, so-called marginal units, and, and loaves of bread or pounds of butter or whatever. If you look at it that way, you'll see why water is might be very, very cost, might be priced very highly in the desert and worth not much in a very high water area. And so this solved the value paradox. It had been solved before on the continental centuries before, but this is a much better, neater, and more fuller and fuller explanation. Another thing that Austrians, Austrianism focused on is that economics is not really a quantitative subject. It's not really a subject it's not really a subject where you can make correlations and quantitative measurements and that sort of stuff, because value is subjective and can't be measured. Um, how, much do I, how much do I prefer? I prefer, for example, Wonder Bread to Tasty Bread. How much? Who knows? I can't say, be pointless for me to say I prefer 3.8 times as much as a loaf of Tasty Bread. And everybody's got different, you certainly can't add up people's subjective preferences. Preferences are ordinal. They're ranking, they're ranking sort of thing. I prefer... Uh, wonder bread, a tasty bread, etc. So, uh, <clears throat> so by by looking at this, we we see that with Austrian. We look at any Austrian book. You can almost tell an Austrian book by looking at it, and thumbing through it. There's no there's no math in there, right? almost none. Uh, and one of the reasons is because it's not a, really a mathematical subject. It's really a, a philosophic subject. Okay, and the distribution front. Um, I saw the British classical school talk in terms of a class struggle between different classes of income receivers. Again, the, the Austrians focus on each individual, the individual factor owner, the individual laborer, individual capitalist, etc. By doing that, they were able to explain individual factor prices, which the classes has never even talked about. Uh, and it's pointed out that the free market, through comp competitive action, entrepreneurial action, tends to impute to each individual factor how much how much uh, his, his productive share of, of a product, a so-called so marginal product or marginal value product. Each factor tends on the market to earn its marginal value product, its contribution uh, to, the, uh, to the actual to the goods being produced. So there's no longer any split between production on the one hand, distribution on the other. John Stuart Mill said the theory of production is all worked out. And it's totally separate from the theory of distribution. This, of course, leads very quickly to a socialist position because you can say, well, we're sure we're in favor of production. We'll allow people to produce. Then we'll grab this all the income and divide it. Uh, equal shares or more to more to people six feet tall, whatever whatever theory of distribution you've got. 
With Wall Street economics, you realize that there's no such sep- there's no separate process called distribution. Distribution comes right out of production. People earn what they contribute to the production. It's very it's very simple then. Uh, and also, Bombardier pointed out for the first time, and Frank Fetter, the American Austrian, developed it, uh, clarified it. Uh, the interest, prof- long run profit, uh, is determined or uh, determined or comes from time preference. This is something, by the way, the, the poor anti usury people could never figure out. The, uh, the Catholic Church theologians who couldn't, who tended to be in favor of the free market, but they couldn't figure out what the justification for interest is. Interest in a pure loan. They could understand about risk, they understood about uncertainty and all that. They just didn't understand about why should people be able to charge 3% or 8% or whatever on a pure loan. And the answer is that people prefer a good right now to waiting for it or, or the present expectation of a good coming in a year from now, 10 years from now, or 100 years from now. Everybody's got a time per- premium rate on present goods immediately available and a discount to the future. That, that determines the rate of interest. Also, Bombardier pointed out in Menger too, the capital, which by the way, modern economics still has not learned. Capital takes time. Production takes time. Capital is a time structure. Uh, some goods are very close to consumers, like you know, producing uh, uh, Wonder Bread, and the retailer, of course, is very close to the consumer. On the other hand, like machinery that goes over, the iron ore that goes into making the machinery that produces Wonder Bread is way up the structure. It takes a lot of time to get this is the earlier process, uh, stage of production, so to speak, or a higher order of production. Uh, so we have then uh, production taking time. We have capital not as a homogeneous lump, which modern economics still tends to say, just add more capital and this is as if it's somehow a blob out there. Uh, capital is a lattice work. It's, it's a network, a structure, which has to, all has to fit in together. And by the way, only the free market can fit it in. Only entrepreneurs with a profit and loss test, profit and loss incentive, and a, a free price system can do the fitting. See, one of the problems with socialism, for example, is they can make some stuff, but they can't, can't fit it together. Like the, often in Russia, you have a situation where the bristles, there's a toothbrush shortage. All of a sudden, there's a toothbrush shortage. Why is there a toothbrush shortage? Well, the bristles are in Omsk, and the, and the handles are in Tomsk, and they just didn't, they never fit the bristles together with the handle. In the free market, you never have this problem. Everything fits because there's a constant feedback mechanism, so to speak, uh, of profit and loss and a free price system. <clears throat> and Bombarder points out, pointed out that the capitalist entrepreneur, again, he, he, and we focus on the entrepreneur in Austrians. In other words, the, the equilibrium is a tendency that was never reached. It's a goal. It's, with the, it's a never, it's ever changing goal, and, and never reach it. So Austrians focus on the process, the real world process by which the economy tends to move toward equilibrium. And, uh, and thereby, of course, we have the whole world of risk and uncertainty and change, which is the real world, which, which equilibrium economics doesn't talk about. And so, therefore, the entrepreneur becomes a key figure in the whole process, the profit and loss system, the incentive to make profits and to avoid losses. <clears throat> and so the capitalist entrepreneur in Austrian theory earns a two-part return. One is an entrepreneur by forecasting better than the next guy, and be able to forecast the future, forecast what demand will be for his product, what cost will be. And also, too, as a capitalist, saving up money and been paying workers right now in advance of their production and sale, for which the workers, in a sense, pay him a discount. They pay him a, a, the interest return. And they're happy to do it because they don't have to wait five years for payroll. Okay. So these are the two basic functions of a capitalist entrepreneur, uh, entrepreneurship and capital saving and investment. Okay, in this atmosphere, and this, um, I'm going to briefly sketch out Austrian economics before von Mises, <coughs> Menger, Bombarder, etc. Uh, Ludwig, Ludwig von Mises uh, comes and born in 1881. Uh, was a brilliant young student of Bombarder's famous seminar at the University of Vienna. And uh, essentially what he saw was that the Austrians had already fixed up these classical errors, the four big British classical errors, value, distribution, and equilibrium, but the one thing they hadn't done yet, one of the main things they hadn't done yet, was to heal the micro-macro split. In other words, the Austrians still had only talked about micro. They, hadn't, they weren't able to extend the Austrian economics to the theory of money. So that was, uh, that was Mises' first great accomplishment. And his magnificent first book, Theory of Money and Credit, came out in 1912. And it's, uh, it's a great, still the best thing ever written on money. And... Uh, what he did was he healed the split, this artificial split. He, has, he applied the margin utility theory of Austrian economics to money, integrated it. He made micro and macro one whole 
beautiful integrated system of economic analysis. Um, <clears throat> so uh, he, he pointed out, for example, you don't need, you don't, you don't, when you get to money, you don't use M and V. You don't forget about supply and demand. The, the, uh, the purchasing power of money, in other words, the value of money, can be decided, decided on the same basis as individual goods and services, namely supply and demand. Uh, an increase of the supply of money lowers its, its value, just as in the case of bubble gum or coffee. And the increase of demand for money raises its value, just like any other good. <clears throat> However, there's a big difference, and this he, he applies some of the Ricardian currency school insights. Uh, the big difference between money on the one hand and other goods on the other hand is that other goods are necessary to production. In other words, specific quantities. Uh, for example, if other things being equal, if you increase resources or increase the supply of goods and services, people's standard of living go up. It's a good thing, so to speak, to have more, to find new resources, to find a new oil strike, or to uh, increase productivity. Okay. But in the, field, the sphere of money is very different. The only real use of money is exchange. You don't eat money, to put it bluntly. Um, and once you have enough money to become money on the market, uh, you don't need any more. In other words, any supply of money which is arrived at on the market is optimal. You don't need any more money coming in. <clears throat> uh, so the only thing that uh, increase the money supply does then, the only social effect, is to dilute the purchasing power of each existing, pre-existing dollar or gold ounce or mark or whatever the currency unit is. So the, any increase in money supports, increase in goods and services is good. It increases the standard of living. An increase in capital equipment is good. It increases future standards of living. An increase in the money supply is pointless because all it does is dilute the purchasing power of the original of the existing unit. There's no social utility whatsoever. Now, under the gold standard, it does because the increase of gold supply has a non-monetary function. In other words, we can, eat, we can use more gold for jewelry, watches, teeth, and that sort of stuff. Okay. But under paper money, of course, there's no social function whatsoever. It, doesn't, it, doesn't, it simply dilutes the purchasing power of the dollar. So, Mises goes into this and he shows basically that, uh, that uh, more money, an increase in money supply beyond the amount of gold available or silver available, redistributes, uh, destroys economic calculation, generally messes everything up, messes up the production system, uh, what happens is a tax where the first receivers of money benefit at the expense of the late receivers. It's very much like counterfeiting. As a matter of fact, it is. The Fed is essentially is our legalized monopoly counterfeiter. And the effect of the Fed increasing the money supply, or the Bank of England, or any central bank, is, essentially, is, very, is almost the same as any, as any counterfeiter. You have a legalized counterfeiter pouring out money down here in Anaheim, you'll have the same sort of effect. An increase in the income of people in Anaheim, first of the counterfeiters, Next to the people the counterfeiters spend the goods, the money on, retailers, let's say, in Anaheim, they're, they're in great shape. They love counterfeiting, right? And so then they begin to spend more. Prices begin to go up. Those of us who don't live in Anaheim or who have a fixed income lose. So the, the inflation process is essentially a counterfeiting process, except it's not people on the run from the Treasury Department. It is the Treasury. It is the Federal Reserve doing it. Okay, so Mises is also built on... Um, on Carl Menger's classic article on the origin of how money originates, and expanded it to show that money has to originate in this way, and namely out of the free market, out of the voluntary actions of, goods of individuals trying to overcome the tremendous difficulties of barter. And uh, he, uh, he shows that money has to originate that way. Money cannot originate as a government edict or by some social compact where everybody gets together in one big convention and says, let's make that money. It can't work that way. It has to work out of a market, a marketable mar market commodity. Unfortunately, of course, then the government can take it over and mess it up. But it has to originate as a, as a market, valuable market commodity, such as gold or silver, which have always outcompeted all the other marketable commodities once it's given a chance. You know, if people know about gold and silver, if society knows about it, they will, outcom will outcompete them. <clears throat> um, also, Mises showed in his theory of money and credit that fractional reserve banking is essentially fraudulent, it's essentially issuing with fraudulent warehouse receipts to non-existent gold or cash, uh, and it creates this whole process, and the ideal system would be 100% reserve banking. Uh, he, he believed, however, and I think it's, it's true, under a genuine free banking system, in other words, if the banks were c compelled to meet their contracts like everybody else is, forced to meet their contracts, if they say, I'm going to give you gold on demand, if you don't give it to them, you go bankrupt. 
Uh, if that were true, we'd have a hard money. We have an approach to it 100% reserve system. Unfortunately, of course, it's never worked that way because the banks are always being bailed out uh, one way or another. And also he showed um, in the theory of money and credit that uh, that uh, utility, he fixed up the margin utility theory. He showed, it's, he showed it's ordinal and can't be measured. The other, Mombavik, was a little bit weak on that. He showed that you can't, uh, since it's subjective, uh, you can't and you can't mathematize it. I mean, even right now, micro textbooks. You look at any any micro textbook. They talk about utils. They talk about utility theory. They say, well, we have utils. If some people, some things are worth five utils. Other things are worth eight utils. Those, those are things that util. What heck's a util? It doesn't exist. <laughs> okay. But if you, if you assume there's such a thing as a util, then you can mathematize it and use calculus and have graphs and tangents and all that junk. Uh, it just doesn't work. It's not true. <laughs> okay. I mean, it's not junk in mathematics. It is junk, however, in economics. Okay, in addition to all that, which is an enormous contribution already, uh, theory of money and credit had, a, had the genesis. In a few pages, he outlined what would become his theory of the business cycle, the great Austrian theory of the business cycle, the Misesian theory of the business cycle. And during the 1920s, he expanded on that, uh, and a work which has been translated since then uh, called uh, On the Manipulation of Money and Credit. <clears throat> and... Uh, and interestingly enough, what happened was most of his, from Bavrak and most of his students, of course, rejected this whole application of money and business cycles, because this is unsound and so forth. And uh, so Mises was a pioneer, uh, scorned even in Austria, <coughs> in that, in that, even in that situation. Okay, in Austrian business cycle theory, which develops during the 1920s with F.A. Hayek as a famous and major follower, but lots of other followers as well, uh, basically what Mises did was he took he formed, he took the, his own money and banking theory, okay, the, what determines the prices and the purchasing power of, of, of money. And, uh, and he also took the currency school, the old Ricardian currency school insight, which, you know, the famous model that if you increase the money supply, prices will go up and then you have a deficit in the balance of payments because prices will be too high and imports will go up and exports will go down. He realized with tremendous insight, this is essentially a business cycle theory. It's never talked about as such in the textbooks. It was not only a theory of money and a theory of international payments, it was also a business cycle theory. It's a, it's a simple model. The banks pump in money, prices go up, there's euphoria, and something happens, they have to contract in this bankruptcy and liquidation. It's a very simple model of a business cycle. He combined that, Mises, with Vixel's, Vixel was a Swedish Austrian, Swedish Bombardier follower, combined that with Vixel's uh, analysis of interest rates and how if the, if the banking rate falls below the natural rate of interest or the, or the free market rate of interest, uh, there'll be inflation. He combined that and he wound up with, with an uh, integrated, magnificent path-breaking theory of business cycle. <clears throat> and uh, essentially what it is, what it says is that an increase in the supply of money and credit through the banking system, through central banking, not only in, causes inflation, everybody will admit that, at least all the neo neoclassicals will admit that, Excuse me, admit that. It also causes other disturbances. It's not just what the Milton Friedman called a helicopter effect. Milton Friedman says we assume that everybody gets a proportionate increase in the money supply dropped by some magical government helicopter. So everybody gets 30% increase in their, in their cash. It doesn't work that way, of course. If it did work that way, there'd be no point to it. The reason why the government, if you start off because we don't have a, because we don't have an angel, a benevolent angel Gabriel doubling everybody's money supply overnight to try to improve their lot. What we have is legalized counterfeiters in Washington or in London increasing their money supply first and lending it out or spending it, and then it ripples out to the rest of the society. So they always, they always one leg up in this, in this expropriation process. So at any rate, so Mises show that an increase in money, money and credit not only increases prices, it, does, it also disturbs, messes up the production system, the whole capital structure. And... Uh, because one of the problems with business cycle theory, there are two really basic problems which any business cycle theory has to explain. One is, how come entrepreneurs suddenly make severe losses? In other words, entrepreneurs are trained in forecasting. They tend to be great forecasters. If they're lousy forecasters, they go out of business pretty quickly. So successful entrepreneurs tend to be good forecasters. How come all of a sudden it turns out that all of them, or many of them, or most of them, went, go bankrupt? They didn't, they didn't forecast successfully at their costs would be much higher than the selling prices. And it was sudden. There's a sudden cluster of entrepreneurial error. Now, this doesn't usually happen. Okay? And usually, economists are trained, or Austrians are certainly trained, 
if something's really messed up in the system, you look at the government. Government must be messing things up somewhere, and sure enough, okay, this is... Uh, and so the second, the second thing which has to be explained is how come there's a much greater fluctuation in capital goods than there is in consumer goods? In other words, uh, there's a much bigger boom, let's say, in machine tools, construction, raw, industrial raw materials, than there is in retail sales. And con contrarily, when a depression or a recession hits, there's a much bigger crash in machine tools, construction, and that sort of thing, and then a higher order of goods than there is in, say, in retail goods. Uh, it should be just the opposite. If, if the Keynesians are right, it should be just the opposite. It should be, the first thing should be hit would be consumer goods. Quite the contrary. As a matter of fact, during the 1929-33 depression, uh, in fact, all during the 30s, retail sales were in pretty good shape. They only declined about 20, 15, 20 percent. It was other things. It was construction or machine tools that declined 90 percent, 80, 90, 100 percent, almost 100 percent. Um, and so that's the, you have to focus on, I'm trying to explain those two things. Well, the Aust only the Austrian, only the Mises theory, only Mises Hayek theory explains these two uh, problems. Namely, the increase in theory money, increase in supply of money and credit disturbs the production structure, leads, messes up the interest rate because more money is pouring into business, business loans than would have by voluntary savings, and leads to an overexpansion of capital goods, so-called higher order goods in particular, the construction, raw materials, machine tools, that sort of thing, plant, basic plant, and the underproduction of consumer goods. So what you have then is a malinvestment in a whole bunch of capital goods. And uh, the longer the boom continues, the more the worse the malinvestment gets. Uh, and so what happens is costs are bid up too high for the supply of savings available. And as soon as the credit expansion stops uh, or slows down significantly, the recession hits. Because then, it's, then this, these malinvestments are revealed. It's revealed now starkly to the people, the entrepreneurs, that they've now they've overbid costs and wage rates too high, and too, much too high for what they can sell to, the, to their uh, to their buyers, not to the consumers so much, but to the other people down the capital goods structure. And so the, uh, what happens then is the recession, in the Austrian analysis, the recession is an unfortunate but necessary process by which the market returns, washes out the unsound investments, and returns to a proper balance between capital goods and consumer goods. In other words, where labor, land, and capital resources are shifted back to consumer goods to a certain amount and out of these, these excessive capital goods. So the, uh, the result is a recession is, is a necessary liquidation process, and any government interference with the recession prolongs it and makes it permanent. It, it doesn't allow the recession process, adjustment process, to work. And uh, also, in particular, the key thing that has to happen is resources have to shift out of capital goods and into consumer goods, and this means that wage rates and capital goods prices have to fall so that relative to the consumer goods, so that people will shift, or resources will shift. To prop the wage rates up, which is what the New Deal did, of course, to prop them up and prevent them from falling, totally destroys the whole adjustment process and prolongs the Depression permanently, which is what happened in the 1930s. Okay, this is essentially the very, again, a capsule summary of the Austrian business cycle analysis. And also, by the way, it also explains about current stagflation. That's the only, the only theory that explains inflationary recession. Um, because what, what, in every business cycle, whether it was pre-World War II or right now, capital goods prices are always going up higher than consumer goods prices in a boom, and consumer goods prices are always going up higher relative to capital goods prices in a, in a recession. But they're still doing it, See, except in the good old days, it means before the New Deal period. Uh, during a recession, everything would fall. There'd be a healthy deflation. In other words, prices would fall in general. Money supply fell because the banks were in bad shape. So the whole money supply would go down, prices would go down, but consumer goods prices would go down not as fast as capital goods prices. In other words, retail sales, furniture would go down 20% in price, let's say, and construction cement would go down 50%. So that's, that's still consumer goods prices would be higher relative to capital goods prices than they were before, which is what you need in a recession. However, consumers loved it because the, the absolute prices were, in money terms were cheaper. Well, now that we have a Keynesian monetarist of semi-Keynesian uh, take, takeover since the 1930s, uh, the money supply has never permitted to fall ever, ever again. In other words, the Fed is always pumping more money into the system, sometimes a little less, sometimes a little more. <clears throat> As a result, during a recession, we never have a fall in prices ever. And so this healthy mask of 
The sugar coating of the pill is now gone, so the consumer is in a recession now faced with two problems. One, unemployment and bankruptcies and all that, which they always were faced with. Plus, the cost of living keeps going up. Because consumer goods prices are still going up relative to the capital goods prices, except now they're both going up in absolute terms. They're not going down because of healthy deflation. So at any rate, we now have a situation where we're getting the worst of both worlds every time there's a recession. We still kept get a big increase in the cost of living, plus we got unemployment. This, this is the result of 50 years of fine-tuning by our beloved, beloved economic experts in Washington. Okay, to get back to Mises personally, personally uh, the, um, Mises taught and developed his views at the University of Vienna. It's true, but he never had a paid post at the University of Vienna. He was discriminated against even, even in Austria. Uh, and he worked for the Chamber of Commerce, or the Department of Commerce, I guess it is, in Austria. And his, his seminar, the very famous seminar, was purely private. He held it, held it in his offices in the uh, Chamber of Commerce. And this seminar is the one that attracted all the top young economists in Europe and philosophers and whatever. And he converted very many of them. I mean, I just list a few of them. Hayek, Machler, Parbler, Robbins, Vogelin, Schutz, uh, and on and on. <clears throat> Even future British Prime Minister Gates Cole, when it was a Mises seminar, was a Labour Party Prime Minister. It wasn't nearly as bad as the other Labour Party people, possibly because of Misesian influence. Uh, in addition to that, this is this tremendous intellectual uh, force that Mises had, and, and this, the so-called Mises Christ, which means Mises Circle. By the way, it must have been a wonderful thing. They used to go out. Every group of intellectuals in Vienna in those days had their own cafe. Now, there were two, 2,000 cafes, and so each one had this... The, Psychoanalysts, the shrinks had their cafe, and the, the positivists had their cafe, and the Misesians had their cafe. So after the Mises seminar was over, they all repair the cafe and, and talk and so forth over coffee and whatever. And it's been great. Uh, also, politically, Mises single handedly uh, stopped the Austrian inflation in the 1920s, stopped it from becoming hyperinflation. Uh, there was a big inflation, but it didn't get as bad as Germany, largely because of Mises' constant pressure by memos and, and political influence. <coughs> Uh, he later, in his notes and recollections, said maybe he shouldn't have done that. Maybe it would have been better if the whole thing collapsed earlier. But anyway, he's quite depressed at that point, I'll mention in a minute. Uh, another thing that Mises did is he warned about the Great Depression. In the 1920s, was a period where essentially a Friedmanite period in many ways, it was a monetarist period. Benjamin Strong, the leader of the Federal Reserve Banks here, was putting into effect Irving Fisher's doctrine, which is essentially pre Friedmanite. And basically what it was is to keep the price level constant. That's, that's the key thing. Keep the price level. And the price level was indeed constant. Wholesale prices remained the same all during the 1920s. So they figured there's no, there's no problem with inflation. What's everybody complaining about? By definition, if price level was constant, there's no problem. However, the Austrian position was, and still is, that the price level is not the key thing, especially because in capitalist development, in free market capitalism, prices tend to fall because you have a tremendous increase in outpouring of goods and services. Uh, especially in, in productive goods. And so prices tend to fall in a free and unhampered market, thereby spreading the advantages of, of, of capitalist development to every, everybody in the country. Uh, we can see that now with specific things like computers and, and calculators, you know, which calculators start off at $500 and have much better ones at $18, or TV sets or personal computers. Tremendous fall in prices during a tremendous inflationary period, by the way. And so what Mises pointed out was that the fact that price level is constant is not such a great thing, but they should be falling. And the reason why it's not falling is that the Fed and other central banks were in, inflating money and credit and propping it up and causing malinvestment, which will cause a recession, a big recession, even though prices haven't gone up. He was laughed at, considered ridiculous. However, of course, uh, the depression, the crash proved him correct. At any rate, uh, that was, he was doing that during the 20s, developing his business cycle theory. He did many other things during the 20s, unbelievable achievements, unbelievable decade for, for Mises. Uh, socialism arises, of course, in World War I, after World War I, or communism, really the same thing. Uh, and everybody, everybody, they have to start analyzing socialism, socialist e economy. Everybody realizes then and now, by the way, that socialism has an incentive problem. That's clear to everybody. In other words, even socialists will admit this. Yes, yes, we have an incentive problem. The incentive problem is summed up in the famous motto, under socialism, who will, who will uh, take out the garbage? Um, that doesn't really work. Or who, or who will go to Siberia? That's another way to put it. In other words, who will go to Alaska? Who's going to develop the underdeveloped, who will schlep out the underdeveloped region and build it up? Well, uh, you, can't, you can't use economic incentive under socialism because either 
either incomes are equal or else they're set by some government authority. The good, the good communists get higher incomes, whatever it is. It's certainly not set by marginal productivity. So who's going to go to Siberia and who's going to, who's going to carry out the garbage? Well, the, answer, the socialist traditional answer is, of course, moral incentive. In other words, people will, or the creation of what's called a new socialist man. Everybody will be molded by socialist government to become totally altruistic and love the collective and do everything for the collective. Uh, in other words, uh, slave labor will carry out the garbage <laughs> and go to Siberia. Um, so even socialists recognize that this is a problem. But what Mises saw was something nobody else had seen till then, was that there's another problem, even deeper economic problem. Even if everybody has the incentive, even if everybody is now, has been brainwashed to be a new socialist man or woman and go out there and work for the collective, whatever the collective does, I'll do it. Okay, I'll go to Siberia, I'll go to the salt mines, I don't care, as long as the state tells me I'll do it. How will the state decide what to tell them to do? That's the real problem of socialism. There's no way that socialist government can calculate and try to figure out who, who do we send to Siberia, how many people, um, what price do we set, who's going to carry out the garbage, how many people should carry out the garbage. There's, there's no way that socialist government can calculate because, as Mises pointed out, there's no free price system, there's no private ownership of the means of production by definition, there's no, and therefore there's no property titles, there's no free market in property titles, there's no way to set up a real price system. There's no way a socialist government can calculate. It's economic chaos. He pointed out in his famous article in 1920, which really upset the socialists in Europe. I mean, they really, they tried to answer it. All the 1920s and 30s, there was a whole famous calculation debate. And he also expanded this in his great book called Socialism a couple of years later. <clears throat> he dealt with other aspects of socialism. At any rate, the socialist, the, when I was going to college uh, too many years ago, the answer was that Oscar Longa had already solved. There's no problem because you have equations and all that, and uh, and the government the government acts as if there's a market. Well, as, as, as Mises already pointed out, there's a lot of nonsense. You can't. This so-called solution assumes perfect competition, perfect knowledge. The socialist government has the perfect knowledge already, of course, and prices, which obviously they don't have. That's the whole point. And also, no socialist government has ever tried to put the Longa solution into effect. Never. As a matter of fact, what's what's happening is that. That socialist planning has broken down. Yugoslavia has gone, and Hungary have gone fairly rapidly toward a free price system, and even China has gone to in the direction of a price system. They realize this, this doesn't work. And then this isn't true in a situation where they still have the world market and world prices to which the government, socialist governments could refer, because they know what the price of wheat is. Okay? And in world socialist government, they wouldn't know that. They'd be totally, totally at a loss. So Mises pointed out, in other words, in addition to its other problems, socialism can't work. It can't calculate a modern economic system. Also during the 1920s, Mises put out a theory, critique of interventionism, which shows that interventionism doesn't work. In other words, price controls create shortages, taxes cripple saving and investment, uh, inflation causes problems we've seen, protectionism is destructive. He showed, and also he shows that interventionism tends to be cumulative, as we see all the time. In other words, interventionism, the government sets out to solve a problem. Somebody goes to the government and says, there's a big problem. Too many people over 60 have hangnails, let's say, have a big hangnail gap. Okay. So we need a multi-billion dollar hangnail solving <laughs> uh, federal funding. So the government then investigates hangnails, pours billions of dollars, doesn't solve the hangnail problem, and creates other problems at the same time. Whatever. I mean, too many side effects from anti-hangnail drugs or whatever it is. So we wind up that so every time the government intervenes, it doesn't solve the original problem and creates two or three more problems at which the government can say, well, we have to have more intervention to solve the two or three others, or they can just forget the whole thing. So interventionism is unstable. It has a cumulative effect. Either you go onward towards socialism or you go back to the free market. <clears throat> what Mises already shown that socialism can't work. So if socialism can't work and interventionism is unstable, you're left with only one viable option for modern industrial world, laissez-faire capitalism. And so Mises then becomes an uncompromising, hardcore, laissez-faire capitalist, uh, pounding away day after day on this question, making himself very unpopular, as you might expect. <clears throat> and his great book on liberalism, which came out in 1927, uh, sets this forth. He also shows in liberalism the political and, and civil liberties aspect, that the economic private property rights, free market, civil liberties, and interna international peace are all in in, this, in inextricably tied together. They're all, they're, all, they're all tied together, which is something very few of us even know to this day. So that's a book that everybody could read with tremendous profit. <clears throat> so this is, uh, in addition to all this, 1920s, and we're not through yet with Mises' accomplishments, he also sees as a challenge to, to Austrian economics and the methodological, philosophical front. 
And the challenge were two, was twofold, basically. And it's still there, by the way, seeing two challenges. On the one hand, institutionalism, which means it's called anti-economics. And the idea of economic theory is, not, is no good anyway. There's no such thing as economic theory. And essentially, economics becomes only history, a record of what's going on. Okay, so that's this one form. This is very quite dominant in the United States in the 1920s, institutionalist approach. And two, which has been the dominant neoclassical approach, logical positivism, with the idea that economics has to be like physics, a quantitative, measurable science where you deduce things, you have false axioms as good because you deduce stuff from them and predict. The whole, the whole thing with the whole unfortunate econometrics uh, mechanistic approach, which we're very familiar with now, <clears throat> where people are treated as if they are stones and atoms. Uh, unfortunately, people are not stones and atoms. They're, they're people who have choices, they have consciousness, they choose their purposes and goals, etc. And so this whole neoclassical economics is, is totally off on a wrong track. And so he thinks about this, and he sets forth his, his uh, views on praxeology, what he calls the correct, what he calls praxeology, the correct analysis, the Austrian analysis of individual action, uh, where economics essentially deals with the logical implication of the fact that people act. How do you know that people act? You just look at you look at yourself and you look at other people. You see that they act. They're not like stones and atoms. They have purposes. And on this knowledge, all of the economic theory is deduced. This is very unfashionable. It's even more unfashionable now than the free market is. You see, Mises had a tough problem. He not only had to fight for laissez-faire capitalism, which is un unfashionable enough, he also had to fight for methodology, which is totally out of fashion, has been, uh, and the race to try to ape, ape physics, to try to imitate physics and, and, math, and the success of nuclear energy and that sort of thing. <clears throat> so he sets forth this in his great book, Grundproblem der National Economy in 1933, which has been translated later. Um, follows us up with his theory and history, a marvelous book he wrote in 1957, uh, showing the difference between theory and history and what their different, their roles are. At any rate, having done all this, as if he hadn't done enough yet, which is like 20 times as much as the average economist accomplishes in a, in a lifetime, he now proceeds, while well, he sets forth the, the proper methodology, it's now his task is to do something with it. In other words, to construct a whole integrated system of economic thought based on the, on the correct methodology. And he does it. And he does it uh, with magnificent crowning achievement, National Economy, which came out in 1940 in Geneva, which unfortunately was neglected. It was during the middle of the war anyway, so it was totally neglected and and then expanded it and rewrote it in English and expanded it in Human Action, 1949, which is the great work as far as I'm concerned in the 20th century. So, uh, okay, while he was doing this in the 1930s, things were happening with Misesian economics, so to speak. In 1931, Mises' follower, Hayek, shifts from Vienna to the London School of Economics. He's brought there by Robbins, who had been in Mises' seminar, and he starts giving lectures and translating his, his books in um, um, Austrian or Misesian capital and business cycle theory, and he, every, he wows everybody. First of all, it's in the middle of a depression. The depression hadn't been predicted by any orthodox economists. And he converts, Hayek manages to convert all the top young economists in England. Hicks, Lerner, <coughs> Caldor, Sir William Beveridge, it wasn't so young, but anyway, all these guys became Austrians at that point. If you read some of the literature journal articles in England, in the early 30s, they all sound like Mises. It was fantastic. It was a great, great few years. Uh, and they accepted the Misesian analysis of the Depression. The Depression came about because of Federal, you know, Federal Reserve and Bank of England, etc., Central Bank credit expansion, and then was prolonged by New Deal intervention into the wage rates and, and, and public yeah. works, etc. Unfortunately, then, and even, even Americans, in those days, Americans thought essentially were followers of English. In other words, we, we look at Britain as the big, as England as the big, as the center of economic thought. <clears throat> so with English economics becoming Hi Hayekian, uh, Americans began to pick up the ball. Alvin Hansen, a leader who became the top American Keynesian, was becoming sort of semi-Austrian, plus a few other people. And suddenly, bingo, Keynes in general theory comes out in 1936. And that's it. It sweeps everything in its path. Uh, and by the way, Keynesianism did not win out by refu patiently refuting Austrian economics. It did not work that way. Uh, aside from the fact it can't be refuted, <laughs> they didn't even try doing it. It just simply it was like the change in, in hemlines, of change in fashions. Everybody forgets the old stuff and goes on to the new bandwagon. And, uh, and um, all these people, except Hayek, all the people Hayek converted shifted to Keynesianism, which is now the big fashion, which is totally the opposite in almost every way of... Austrian thought. Now, Hayek had previously smashed, literally, Keynes' previous great work, The Treatise on Money, which came out in 1931. Hayek had two long reviews in Economica showing the whole thing as hogwash. 
It was so effective that Keynes had to go back to the drawing board and do something else. So when the general theory came out, Hayek made his great strategic error. He said, why should I refute this? It'll be gone in a couple of years also. And so unfortunately he didn't try, he didn't do anything about it. And the rest is unfortunately history. <coughs> uh, where everybody was looking for a way to, to defend I mean, class, uh, historically, economists have always been the ones to, to oppose inflation and, and, balance, and deficit spending. And here, all of a sudden, deficit spending becomes a great thing, becomes economically required. And so, of course, all the governments loved it, and all the economists loved it, because then they could get good, cushy, cushy jobs in the establishment. Uh, so while this is going on, poor Mises is now being hit as a refugee. He goes to, he flees Vienna, which had become a Nazi in the 30s, and goes to Geneva. And when, when Germany uh, conquers Western Europe, he and his wife flee to the United States. It was really sort of, it was really like a, a movie scenario because they could go just, just ahead of the German army. Uh, and his Notes and Recollections, which is an autobiography he wrote during 1940, he was very depressed then, as you can imagine. <clears throat> he says he, uh, he writes that he, he didn't think when he started off that he was, his, his fate was the chronicle of the decline of civilization or the end of civilization. And he also says something interesting there. He says that Mises Menger, excuse me, withdrew from economics and von Bavere committed suicide because of World War I. In other words, they figured World War I at the end. It's the finish. It's the end of all their ideals of liberalism, classical liberalism, and international peace and free markets. Anyway, so in this state, Mises comes to the United States. He's penniless. He's, in his, he's about 60 years old or so. He starts writing in a new language, and he can't get an academic post. This is, this is to me, is an eternal blot on academia. Uh, now this is a situation where every every Marxist and semi-Marxist and three-quarter Marxist were getting cushy top chairs okay, at Harvard and, and uh, Princeton and whatever. And Mises, they couldn't, Mises couldn't find an academic post. He had finally got one at NYU as a visiting professor with a salary paid for by outside businessmen and, and foundations. And the same thing happened to Hayek. Hayek's, post, Hayek's salary at the University of Chicago was never paid for by Chicago. It was paid for by outside business groups. Uh, as a result, Mises was scorned at NYU. The dean was against him. The dean would advise people not to take his courses and things like that. Um, see, here he was in a fantastically miserable situation. And yet, what was his, and here's where I come into the picture, because I got to know him at this point, uh, when he started a seminar at NYU. What was his spirit about this? How did he act? It was magnificent. I couldn't believe it. I mean, he was, he was cheerful. He was never bitter. never said an unkind word about anything, any person. And... Uh, he was constantly trying, very sweet, he was constantly trying to urge people to be productive. Any spark of productivity in any of us clunks is immediately nourished <laughs> by Mises. And he's dealing with people like far below the level of Hayek and Harbauer, etc. He didn't seem to bother him at all, just, just great. He tried to reestablish the seminar atmosphere of, the, of, the, of Vienna. <clears throat> we went out to Charles Restaurant, I think it was, afterward, and, and, uh, and discussed things. So... Uh, <clears throat> It was, uh, he was kindly, he was uncomplaining, he was, was never bitter, and uh, it was a just magnificent experience. I told, I told this story before, but I'm going to tell it again, because I think it's classic about Mises. Um, people were very intimidated. First of all, half the people didn't know anything, didn't care. They were just there to get their, their automatic B or A or something. Uh, the rest of the people, those who were interested, the outside auditors mostly, uh, were too intimidated. He's this great man. What do we know? Can, how can we say anything? So what he say is, look, Say anything you want, because whatever, whatever you say, however, however idiotic it is, has already been said before you by some eminent economist. <laughs> of course, he's right. He was right. So, uh, and he tell these great anecdotes about Max, ba his friend Max Weber, and things like that. And uh, so it was just, it was just marvelous. At any rate, um, he uh, in this situation, in this. Uh, being scorned, etc., and not having any, any followers at the beginning. He writes Human Action, this, this great crowning work. And uh, when Human Action came out, I was going up to Fee at the time, which is the Foundation for Economic e Education, which, which was the only, literally the only free market outfit in the country. It's not like now, where every, every Tom, Dick, and Harry says he's in favor of the free market. And, uh, and uh, they said that Mises, I hadn't met Mises yet, they said he's coming out with a new book. I said, oh, what's it about? They said, everything. <laughs> And sure enough, it's about everything. That's it's it. It's the whole ball of wax. And uh, I, urge, I urge you to read it. I mean, it's a, more than I urge you. It's magnificent. So, um, and I think, and, but some, despite these conditions, despite the fact that these, these uh, oppression under which he worked, uh, I, there were some, many good people that emerged out of this Mises seminar. Uh, Professor Zenholz, Israel Kersner, Sylvester Petro, 
Percy Graves, and many other people. Okay? And it's really, Amesis has inspired much of the current hard money movement. I think uh, it's, all, it's really all due to him. Uh, he died at the age of 92 in 1973, uh, for a remarkably productive life, and a year later, Hayek got the Nobel Prize, which sort of inspired other economists. Well, who's this guy Hayek? Why is he getting a Nobel Prize? And it's interesting that he got the prize specifically for his Misesian work that he did in the 1930s. Misesian business cycle theory, which was swept away in the Keynesian Revolution. <clears throat> And since then, there's been a notable Austrian revival, and I think it's all due to Mises, and it's just unfortunate he didn't live to see it. Thank you very much.